Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk a little bit about a previous video where we looked at a Japanese copy of the legendary Messerschmitt ME262 in the Nakajima Kika. This twin-engine jet fighter had a rather interesting story behind it, as it wasn't just a simple one-to-one -one copy of the 262, but rather due to a strange, almost movie-like set of circumstances, Japan basically had to take some notes scribbled on a cocktail napkin and make that into a jet fighter. And the fact that they came away with anything functional is actually pretty impressive, especially when you consider that Japan was not economically, technologically, or logistically set up to properly develop a jet fighter. To give a shorter version of that story, Sometime in late 1943 or early 1944, Japan sent a team over to German-controlled France to study Germany's progress on jet and rocket technology. In their studying, they would be given copies of ME-262 and ME-163 blueprints, some copies of German jet engines, various aircraft parts, and potentially even an entire ME-163 aircraft. This was a lot of important data and technology, and to safely move all of this back to Japan, the only logical option really was to travel by submarine, which would have still been a dangerous and long journey. Amazingly, the submarine made it as far as Japan-controlled Singapore, but after departing from Singapore, the sub was detected and sunk, taking with it all of that data and technology, along with the team that studied the German planes. Except one of the team members, a man named Aichi Awaya, departed Singapore separately from the rest of the team and the sub, and he carried with him some of the data and documentation from this journey. However, because he was just one man, he wasn't carrying very much, and what he had on him was either simple, limited, rudimentary, or some combination of all three. So in the case of the ME-262 data, all they had to go off of was some simple notes, some pictures of the ME-262, and a basic cutaway image of a BMW 3 jet engine. So basically, they could see what it looked like, and they had to go off of just that. And they ended up making what was basically a simplified, kind of blocky, dumbed-down version of the ME-262 in the Kika. And also, of course, because it was late war Japan, they also decided that in addition to this serving as a fighter and interceptor, it would serve as a kamikaze as well, which was a massive waste of resources. But for more information on the Kika, take a look at my video on it. I think it's a pretty solid one. But the submarine was also carrying information on the ME-163 Comet. And just like with the ME-262 data, much of what was being carried was lost after the submarine was sunk. Gone were the copies of the 163 blueprints. Gone were completed rocket engines that the 163 used. And gone was potentially even a fully constructed and flyable 163. It wasn't like Iwaya could carry all of that in what I assume was either a briefcase or just his jacket pocket. So instead of all these fully functioning full-scale rockets and aircraft, Iwaya returned back to Japan with just a simple ME-163 instruction manual. Now, this instruction manual presumably would have at least some details on the internal workings of the design, how to operate it, how to make some repairs, and there would certainly be some images of the plane in the manual. But more than likely, the manual wouldn't contain anything in great detail or what would be wanted or needed to produce a copy of the 163. Still not wanting their effort to go to waste, and still wanting slash needing a new fighter and interceptor, 
they took their very limited information and set about replicating the 163, and by mid-1944, Specification 19-C was issued for a new rocket-powered interceptor, and Mitsubishi would be tasked with the creation of this aircraft. This is the Mitsubishi J-8M Shusui. Initially, it was planned that because Japan had no experience whatsoever with aircraft that were shaped like the 163, or aircraft powered by rockets, that they would produce a simple one-for-one -one copy of it. Plus, the 163 was proven to fly pretty solidly, so there was no real reason to change the design. However, because Japan did not have the overall experience or technical ability to produce rocket engines like Germany could, and they didn't even really know how to make an exact copy now since they didn't have enough information, Japan's version of the 163 would inevitably end up being at least a little bit different and probably inferior to Germany's version. Measuring in at 6.05 meters long, 9.5 meters wide, and 2.7 meters tall, Mitsubishi's version of the 163, given the official designation of J8M Shusui, it was actually slightly larger than the 163, which is surprising given Japan's propensity for making much smaller aircraft. I would presume that this slightly larger size might have had to do with the engine, it being a Japanese copy of the Walter HWK-109 rocket engine. That also presumably was not a one-to-one -one copy, and was more than likely slightly less efficient and effective overall. Of course, this size difference might have also really just been coincidence or accidental, with Japan just making the copy the best that they could with what they had, and the size ended up being a little bit off. Whatever the reason, though, the J-8M's overall design was remarkably close to the 163, and Mitsubishi did a much better job at copying the 163 than Nakajima did the ME262. And aside from a slightly more pointed nose and slightly thicker wings, the J8M was damn near a carbon copy on the surface. Under the surface, though, the J8M would be a little bit different. Not terribly so, but somewhat different. The J-8M would retain the pair of 30 mil cannons that were found in the ME-163, but Japan's 30 mil cannons were slightly lighter than Germany's. Additionally, Japan elected not to armor the cockpit, a pretty common thing for Japanese fighters in an effort to keep them lighter and more maneuverable, and the J-8M would also overall have less ammo than the 163. These slight differences resulted in an overall empty weight of just 3,318 pounds, about 900 pounds less than the 163, and an overall max weight of 8,565 pounds, which was about 1,000 pounds less than the 163. And hopefully this lesser weight would help make up for Japan's lack of experience with rocket propulsion. Beginning work on a mock-up of the design shortly after 19 Shi was issued, Mitsubishi would actually work quite quickly for that mock-up to be inspected. By early September, a mock-up of the cockpit had been completed, and by the end of September, a completed full-scale mock-up had been made and approved. At this time, though, the copy of the German rocket engine was not ready yet and wouldn't be for quite a while. But considering the increasingly dire situation Japan found themselves in in the war, and considering the lack of experience Japanese pilots would have with an aircraft like the J-8M, Yokosuka would be contracted to construct training gliders of the J-8M, given the designation MXY-8. These all-wood gliders that were dimensionally the same as the J-8M, 
but were outfit with some simple wheels for repeated use and landing, they were developed rather quickly, and by December 1944, the first MXY-8 was completed, and on December 8, 1944, likely being towed into the air by a Nakajima B-6N, it conducted its first test flight, and reportedly under the control of a Japanese pilot that had actually flown the 163 over in Germany, the MXY-8 controlled exactly the same as the 163. Obviously, it wasn't under rocket power, but the handling and control at lower gliding speeds was solid, and further, more detailed testing was certainly warranted. Further MXY-8 models would be constructed, and some of them would be outfit with some water tanks that would be filled to simulate the weight of the fuel and the rocket engine that would be present on the J-8M, giving the pilots some proper control and handling experience at a nearly full weight. And while this was going on, development of the rocket engine would continue, and despite the engine being heavily based on the German Walter engine, it ended up not outputting the same overall thrust, and that kind of doomed the J-8M to be inferior to the 163. Still though, plans for the plane's development and construction continued regardless. And with all of this going on as well, in February 1945, with Mitsubishi effectively building the J-8M kind of blind, it was decided to actually get some proper information on the ME-163. And so another set of documents like journal entries and blueprints and whatnot were agreed to be sent over to Japan from Germany departing from Norway on German submarine U-864, the travel back to Japan ended up being delayed by an engine failure on the submarine. And even when that failure was fixed, the 163 information would remain out of Japanese hands. After the submarine returned to port to repair the broken engine, the British vessel Venturer spotted the submarine and began opening fire. After dodging several torpedoes, one finally struck the sub, splitting it in half, and thus ruining the second attempt at bringing information over to Japan. Without those new documents and document copies, Japan continued work on the J-8M, kind of flying blind and hoping for the best. And unfortunately for Japan as well, the rocket engines still were not ready, and it would be a while before they were. The rocket engines were only getting maybe a couple minutes of firing time apiece, and in one scenario, an engine exploded after only firing for a grand total of two minutes. It would clearly be a while before the engines were in good enough condition that they were ready to install on a working J-8M frame. Making matters even worse, all during the production of the MXY-8 and the J-8M frames and the rocket engines, Japan was under significant bombardment from Allied forces, which would cause supply chain issues, work stoppages, damage factories and buildings, and in the case of where they were making the rocket engine, it forced them to relocate the factory in an effort to keep it and the rocket engine safe. So with these external factors slowing down work, it wouldn't be until June 1945 that the rocket engines were somewhat reliably firing for longer than two minutes, which doesn't sound like a major achievement, but the initial goal was to get the engines firing reliably for longer than two minutes, and they achieved that. So, with the engines firing long enough to fit their standards, in June 1945, a J-8M was outfit with a rocket engine. Then it took about a month for the kinks to be worked out here and get the engine firing properly inside the J-8M. And by July 7th, 1945, the J-8M took to the air for the first time. 
the initial and spoiler only flight of the J8M was a roller coaster of a high and a low. So, more like a cliff, I guess, or maybe a hill. The J8M rapidly accelerated and managed to take off. That was good. But then, at just around a thousand feet, a puff of smoke came out of the exhaust and the engine stopped firing. After the plane leveled off, the J8M began gliding back down to Earth. But with where the plane was at, the pilot was in a real pickle here. He was screaming towards a building on the runway, and try as he might, he was not able to avoid hitting it. In that collision, much of the J-8M was destroyed, and the test pilot was left mortally wounded, passing away just a couple days later. With this failure, Mitsubishi and the Japanese military was left picking up the pieces, wondering what just happened. More than likely, it was due to some kind of fuel line issue, and when the plane entered a climb, a poorly functioning fuel pump made it so that the fuel could not adequately travel to the engine, and thus starved the engine of its fuel, which caused it to fail. This forced Mitsubishi back into the lab to fix this issue, and all things considered, they were pretty quick to fix the problem and hopefully get the planes back out there for further testing. Despite this rapid discovery, though, that further testing never got the chance to occur, and the J-8M never took to the air again. With a further six J-8Ms being constructed, along with several more training gliders, Japan planned on getting the J-8M back into the air sometime in late August 1945. And earlier that month, America would drop the atomic bomb, and then do it again a few days later, and then about a week after that, Japan surrendered. This meant that Japan's military projects came to an end, and especially coming to an end was a project where the whole point was to make a bomber interceptor to defend against incoming Allied bombers. Bombers wouldn't be incoming anymore, so there was nothing to intercept. After the war ended, two of the J-8Ms made their way over to the United States, one being given to the Army and one to the Navy, where they were studied but likely not flown. The J-8M that was given to the Navy would be scrapped shortly after, but the one given to the Army was afterwards sent off to the Plains of Fame Air Museum where, as far as I can tell, it is still on display. But overall, even though the J-8M didn't end up being successful and had a horrible accident the only time it flew, it is still rather impressive that they managed making it at all and got it into the air at all, under heavy fire from Allied forces, lacking in vital resources, lacking in safe research and manufacturing space, and basically working off of a pamphlet of information, they managed to actually make a decent enough copy of the ME-163. It would kind of be like if Japan had one of those old manuals that they used to give you with video games, and while they had received a copy of Call of Duty 2, they used that to make the History Channel Civil War game, which was a significant step down, but also still weirdly impressive. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. You know, that History Channel Civil War game, I have a really weird soft spot for it because it's not a good game. It's clunky and weird, it doesn't control well, it's not well designed, yet I think it's still really entertaining to play. There's something about it that's just kind of charming. Like the little intro scene from the first Union side mission is kind of burned into my brain. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!